if you think about the Russia-China alliance, you get huge geopolitical effects out of the fact that this is basically a de facto non-aggression pact. And so Putin can hurl literally his entire army at Ukraine. You know, there, there's some statistics that indicate 90 percent of the Russian army is in Ukraine at this point because he has no fear whatsoever of aggression from China on their long land border. Welcome to Shield of the Republic, a podcast sponsored by the Bulwark and the Miller Center of Public Affairs at the University of Virginia and dedicated to the proposition articulated by Walter Lippmann that a strong and firm foreign policy uh, and balanced foreign policy is the shield of our democratic republic. I'm Eric Edelman. I'm a counselor at the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments. I'm also a non-resident fellow at the Miller Center and a Bulwark contributor. Uh, and I'm joined this week by friend of Shield of the Republic and uh, now in poll position as the guest uh, who's had the most appearances, which has, I think, something to do with how prolific he is as a historian, uh, Hal Brands. Hal? Welcome to Shield. Welcome back to Shield of the Republic. Thank you, Eric. It's a great pleasure to be here, and it's my my status as most frequent uh, guest is all the sweeter because it comes at the expense of my good friend Peter Fever, who I understand is in second place. So I'm yeah. extra delighted to be here today. Yeah. So yeah, uh, you've you've inched past, uh, or you know, got your nose past Peter at the tape here. But uh, well, I'm sure we're going to have Peter back uh, at some point soon. Uh, but uh, but how? Um, a lot of uh, things to talk to you about, but um, uh, in addition to your weekly Bloomberg column and, and frequent appearances in foreign affairs, and I want to come back to your most recent foreign affairs article, uh, you also are the editor of a uh, uh, a new volume that's just appeared, uh, War in Ukraine, Conflict Strategy and the Return of a Fractured World, uh, published by Johns Hopkins University Press. I, I want to let our listeners and viewers know that you can actually access a uh, uh, electronic version, a PDF version of the book by going to uh, press.jhu.edu. You'll be able to find the book there. And um, you can also order a hard copy if you like from Amazon. But uh, Hal, ex explain to our, our audience a little bit of how this uh, book came to be. Sure. And I should say at the outset, this is the best kind of book because it's free. Uh, and so you, you can buy a copy if, if you like, but you can also, as Eric mentioned, just go and download it. It's available open access so anybody can get access to any part of it that they, they want. Um, the idea was to get together a group of really excellent world-class commentators to take stock of the war basically two years in and to think about how it had started, how it had unfolded uh, since February 2022, and then what its global implications have been and will be in the future. And uh, anytime you're trying to do something like this, you're shooting at a moving target. But we were aided in the fact that this, this is a little bit of an Insta book. So I, I invited people to a conference that was held in February, and then the book came out six weeks later. Uh, and so, you know, hopefully these essays uh, have not yet reached their sell-by date and, and will not for some time. It's a great group of contributors that I had the privilege of sort of um, pulling together. Uh, and, it, you know, people like Steve Kotkin, Ann Applebaum, uh, Michael McFaul, uh, Frank Gavin, uh, a variety, uh, Lori Friedman, Mike Kaufman, you know, a lot of people who have been sort of most visible in terms of talking about the Ukraine war and its impacts on the international system. And so I think there are about 16, uh, 17 essays in the volume, and they give you a really interesting picture of the war and all of its origins, dimensions, and implications. Yeah, I don't want to make any invidious comparisons or, or you know, injure anybody's vanity by you know, leaving them out. But uh, you know, a couple of, of the essays really <clears throat> jumped out at, at me. I mean, uh, uh, Laurie Friedman's essay about uh, Putin as, as a strategic fanatic, uh, for instance, uh, uh, Frank's uh, essay on the nuclear aspects uh, of this, Mike McFall and uh, Rob Person's essay on uh, on how the you know war came to be. Um, 
there, there are a lot of really uh, great, and uh, you know, my colleague Tom Mankin's uh, essay on uh, doctrine, a military doctrine, and what that tells us about the war. I, really, a lot of great work here. And again, I, I don't mean to slight anybody who I didn't mention. You mentioned some as well. Uh, the the um, I, I, look, I, I want to say that uh, having worked with you on a previous book um, and having blurbed this one. Uh, I, I take my hat off to you, particularly uh, in terms of uh, herding all these cats uh, in a very short period of time to actually get them to uh, pony up their contributions. And, and it's, um, you know, the quality in, in a lot of uh, instant books, as you said, is, you know, sometimes, you know, a little bit spotty. This is really, I, I think, very high quality volume. So I, I really take my hat off to you for for doing that. You also provided an introduction, Hal, that kind of outlined six themes that kind of came through all of these essays collectively. Could you, could you run through the six themes a little bit? Because I think they're worth, uh, you know, sort of taking some time with. Sure. So I'll, I'll do the Reader's Digest version of it here, and then we can dig deeper into whichever ones may be of, of interest. You know, one of the neat things about doing a volume like this is you get to try to take it all in and then figure out what it what it all means. And so in my introduction, I wrote a little bit about some themes that I had written about in other places, but also stuff that emerged from the work that the contributors who, who really did, you know, most of the heavy labor uh, in this endeavor had put together. And the, the six themes that sort of stuck out were, first, uh, this war, it's worth remembering, did not begin in February 2022, even if that's when the most intense and catastrophic phase began. It, it obviously dates back to February 2014 and Putin's taking of Crimea and subsequent uh, intervention, first covert and then over in eastern Ukraine. But Putin's project to sort of control Ukraine in one way or another dates back at least a decade before that to his efforts to intervene in the 2004-2005 presidential elections there, the, the failed effort to do so, which touched off the Orange Revolution in the first place. And then the Ukraine war has context that go much, much deeper than that. And so you can think of this as one of many wars of the Soviet succession, basically the violent conflicts that played out in the post-Soviet space as part of the long collapse and then attempted resurrection of that empire. Um, you can think about it in the longer run of Russia-Ukraine relations, as Vladimir Putin clearly does. Um, or you can think about it in a way that I talk about in a forthcoming book, uh, in the sense that Ukraine has actually been at the center of, of all of the great power clashes of the past hundred years, because it really sits at the hinge of Europe and Asia. And so if you're a Eurasian power expanding into Europe, you basically got to go through Ukraine. If you're a European power expanding into Eurasia, you basically got to go through Ukraine. And so in World War I, World War II, and the Cold War, it, it played a, a, an important role. So that was theme one. Theme two was that this particular phase of the conflict emerged from a double failure. It was a failure on the part of the West to deter the Russian assault in February 2022, but also a Russian failure to achieve political control of Ukraine through any means short of all-out war. And so to pick up on the second part of that first, you know, Putin had been after this for two decades and he had started with poisoning and political meddling. He had moved on uh, to sort of limited land grabs and covert interventions, then kind of the frozen conflict uh, approach. And the problem was that uh, Ukraine was not reacting as Putin hoped Ukraine was reacting. And so every time he intervened in Ukraine or he nibbled off a piece of it, what remained of Ukraine became more pro-Western, more likely to align with the United States, uh, the transatlantic community, and the European Union. And so um, Putin found himself in a situation in early February 2022 where uh, he was pushing Ukraine farther and farther away from Russia, and I think was genuinely concerned about where that was going, even though he had gotten himself into that pickle. And so for a variety of reasons, chooses February 2022 to escalate in a big way. But of course, the West, unfortunately, had really not, not done much to convince him prior to February 24th that this would be a disaster for Russia. That, that's true of the Western reaction to the February 2014 taking of Crimea, which I think we would all agree now was, was pretty tepid and, and lacking. Um, and it was true in the run-up to the February 24th invasion as well, when you know, even as the Biden administration, I think, was genuinely trying to make Putin fear the costs of invasion, it was having a hard time getting the European allies on the same page. It was having a hard time coordinating uh, 
a sanctions package and, you know, rightly or wrongly had decided that any any effort to sort of deter militarily was more or less off the table. So that was theme two. Theme three was that the war has played out in ways that were both immensely contingent and fairly predictable. Immensely contingent in the sense that the war did not have to go this well for Ukraine. Um, everybody thought, almost everybody thought back on February 23rd, 2022, that Ukraine was just going to get steamrolled uh, in this conflict, that it was going to be over in days or weeks and you'd have the Russians and sitting in Kiev and installing a puppet government uh, and probably annexing Ukraine or some large part of it to the Russian Federation. Um, it didn't go that way, but it, but it could have. Um, had a few battles gone differently in the early going, you know, the Russian attempt to take Hostomel Airport uh, and create the air bridge coming into Kyiv, um, a few engagements where understrength Ukrainian units, sometimes supplemented by basically civilians or, you know, territorial defense forces, stopped Russian attacks, uh, occasionally at extremely high cost. You, you could actually have had a scenario where the government collapsed, Zelensky chose to flee, as many people were urging him to, and the Russians do achieve at least some of their uh, objectives, although they probably would have faced an insurgency after that. So that was the contingent part. The predictable part, though, is that um, since then, the war has played out in ways that I think, you know, students of modern warfare might have expected, right? And so when sort of the coup de main approach fails, you end up with a long protracted war of attrition. The war reminds us how difficult it is to bust through well-prepared defenses. That's what we saw during the Ukrainian counteroffensive in 2023. Uh, it reminds us of, you know, how tough Russia can be even after it gets punched in the face a bunch of times. And, you know, we've really seen um, a, a dismaying, but, but in some ways impressive amount of Russian military adaptation and resilience over the past uh, 18 months in particular, uh, given that it looked like the Russian forces were on the verge of collapse in late 2022. You know, we've seen, we've been reminded, I suppose, how hard it is for even pretty harsh sanctions packages to inflict real damage on a country, an economy the size of, of Russia's, uh, and so on and so forth. And so there are patterns of this war, I think, that would have been familiar to people who would pay much attention to 20th century history, even as parts of it were very contingent. Fourth, uh, this war has hastened the division of the international system. Even before this, you had a process where the world was coming increasingly divided, not quite at Cold War levels, but something like that, between kind of advanced democracies on the one hand and Eurasian autocracies on the other. Uh, this war has put that into overdrive, basically because it has convinced the advanced democracies they need to band together more closely to either counter this aggression or prevent something like it from happening in East Asia. And the Eurasian autocracies have gotten together more closely because Russia has become deeply, deeply dependent on their support and has been willing to cut um, better deals from the perspective of Iran or North Korea or China than it had been before. There's obviously the third piece of this, which is that it has also accentuated the desire of a number of countries to sort of stay out of this, right, to maintain a degree of flexibility. That's true of everybody from you know Saudi Arabia to India to uh, Indonesia. But nonetheless, we, we've seen sort of the hastening of the return of a divided world, uh, a fractured world, as we call it in the book, as a result of this. Fifth, um, this war marks the return of great power nuclear crises. We really hadn't seen um, a great power nuclear crisis in several decades, you know, maybe going back to Abel Archer in 83 or the Yom Kippur War uh, in 73. Before that, there have been pronounced nuclear dynamics from this uh, crisis from the beginning. We've seen the threats that um, Putin has made somewhat obliquely and that a lot of his subordinates have made much more explicitly that Russia might use nuclear weapons if the West were to interfere in a more direct way uh, in the conflict. We, we've seen moments at which U.S. officials appeared to fear that Russia might actually use uh, some sort of battlefield nuclear weapon, particularly in late 22, uh, when the Russian position on the battlefield did not look Great. And so um, we're in for more of this, most likely, because you're going to be coming into an era where great power crises are going to become more common. And we're moving into a more nuclearized world because it's not just that Russia has modernized its nuclear forces over the past couple of decades. China is obviously in the midst of a similar modernization and expansion uh, right now. And then the final one uh, is just that the, the outcome of the war and the uh, war's effects for international order are, are yet to be written. And so, you know, as we sit here in early April 2024, uh, things don't look great from Ukraine's perspective, but there's still actually, you know, some 
variation that's possible in the outcomes of the war. You, you can imagine one scenario where the U.S. continues to fall on its face in terms of providing more military assistance and the Ukrainians lose the war in some significant way, probably not ending up with the country conquered by Russia or anything, but forced to make a very disadvantageous peace that, that turns the country into something like a Russian client state. Um, you can imagine scenarios where Ukraine gets more foreign support, where uh, it develops the ability to defend effectively during this year, maybe go back on the offensive next year and get to a more durable, advantageous peace that perhaps sees it more integrated into Western institutions as well. And so there's a lot of contingency there. And how the war ends will have a big effect on the international system. It'll have a big effect on how people perceive the balance of strength and advantage between the Western democracies and the Eurasian autocracies. It'll have a big effect on the balance of power in Eastern Europe and throughout the former Soviet space and in a variety of other ways uh, as well. And so there's a huge amount that is still at stake in this conflict two years in. Well, that's great. That's a great uh, summary, not only of the, uh, you know, of your uh, introduction, but the themes that, you know, kind of course through the essays and, and through the um, through the conference on which um, on, on which all of this was based. And I should, uh, you know, in full disclosure, I should uh, admit to having been a participant in the conference, although not an author of one of the papers. How I want to go back to kind of the uh, the second theme, you know, you you talked a lot about um, Russian failures in Ukraine in your comments here, uh, Putin's inability to essentially execute his um, his strategy. I mean, you know, at one level, you could actually say he, you know, he's the author of all his own misfortunes in, in the sense that, uh, you know, uh, the Orange Revolution, uh, which kicked off a series really of, it wasn't the first, I guess Georgia was technically the first, but it's part of this sort of series of so-called color revolutions that clearly spook uh, Putin and have uh, animated his approach to the West, I, I would argue, ever ever since. Um, but a lot of it really is his own doing, his own misjudgments about Ukraine and about uh, you know Western responses, et cetera. You didn't talk so much about um, the West's uh, failures. You, you mentioned a, a little bit about um, the the Biden administration. I mean, I have a sense that um, folks in the Biden administration did understand and accept that um, there had been, as you put it, a, maybe a, a little a lacking in the response to the 2014 seizure of, of Crimea. Um, now, what's interesting about that is President Obama told people at the time that he a didn't want to have a nuclear war over Ukraine, and b that Putin was always going to care more about Ukraine than we did, um, and therefore he refused to provide Ukraine with lethal assistance because he believed Russia would always have escalation dominance in this in this theater. Um, the Biden administration, it seems to me, uh, kind of. Uh, it buys some of that, but not all of that. And it it has tried to um, be more forward-leaning in aid to Ukraine. I mean, President, then Vice President Biden, actually supported lethal assistance to Ukraine uh, in 2014 and 15. He was overruled by, by President Obama. Um, so he has provided lethal assistance. So there's been a view that's somewhat different from what obtained in, in the Obama administration. But there has also been this uh, acute concern about um, the, you know, something else you referred to, which is the danger of nuclear escalation. And a, a I would say, almost, um, you know, religious devotion to the notion that Washington can somehow manage escalation here, that it can control even while providing a lot of uh, military assistance to Ukraine, the level of violence uh, from, you know, with a 5,000 uh, mile screwdriver, you know, from, from far away. It, it, do you think that's a fair uh, assessment that, they've, that they have on the one hand, uh, you know, gone beyond where Obama was, but on the other hand, they're uh, concerned with some of the same things, which has limited what they're willing to do? Yeah. So just to put a 
fine point on it. I mean, the Biden administration has been willing to help Ukraine kill over 100,000 Russian personnel, right? And and that is something the Obama administration never would have done. You know, the Obama administration, the president in particular, thought that it was unacceptably escalatory to provide the Ukrainians with even the most modest amount of defensive weaponry when their territory was under assault. The, the counter argument at the time, by the way, was that uh, even if you can't kick the Russians out of Ukraine, if you don't show them that they're going to pay a serious cost for this, they're going to do it again somewhere else. And, and of course they did. Right. And so one of the reasons why um, I, I think Putin gambled incorrectly that he could get away with this in February 2022 is that he just hadn't paid a huge price for invading Ukraine twice before. So I, I think we should give credit to the Biden administration for being much more risk acceptant than that. And and by being willing to do, you know, some pretty edgy things, if you just read the public press reporting about ways in which U.S. information has reportedly helped Ukrainians carry out some pretty daring and effective operations. I do think uh, I was listening, you know, I'm a, I'm a longtime listener of, of your show, to your show, as you know, and, and you were talking about sort of this Weberian ethic of responsibility. Um, and I, I think the Biden administration also feels that, you know, whether the risk of nuclear escalation in Ukraine, you know, we may not be able to say whether it's 1% or 17% or somewhere in between, but if it's more than 0%, you can't take that lightly and you can't simply wave it away. And remember that early in the conflict in particular, uh, we hadn't had this sort of two plus years of interaction with Putin to sort of understand exactly where the red lines might be. It was more we were learning in, in real time. And so I, I have a certain sympathy for uh, the approach that the Biden, or at least empathy for the approach that the Biden administration took in 2022, which was to introduce new, more sophisticated capabilities gradually to see what the Russian response was and then figure out, you know, how you could go further. I, I think you can maybe make the critique that this pattern has become a little bit of a self parody at, at a certain point where, you know, it's Ukrainians ask for something. It's, you know, no, they don't need it. No, we don't have it. No, it would be a bad idea to give it to them. Okay. Yes. Right. And by the time we get to yes, it's been eight months from the time the discussion started, by by which point, you know, you've lost eight months by the time the thing appears on the battlefield. And that's one of the reasons that, you know, we sometimes find ourselves in a little bit of a difficult spot now. But, you know, I'm not sure. And this is maybe where I depart a little bit from the critiques that um, some of the more hawkish observers have, have issued. I, I'm actually not sure that if the U.S. had been willing to provide Atacums in 2022, that we would be in a fundamentally different place than we are today. I, I think it's possible, you know, I think more sooner would have been better. But if you think about, you know, the challenges that the Ukrainians have had in scaling offensive operations, if you think about how worn out Ukrainian forces were at the end of 2022, and I think they really didn't have much choice but to pause after Kharkiv and Kherson. Um, I'm not sure that they sort of would have won the war by now had the U.S. you know provided F-16s or Abrams or ATACMs, even though the synergistic effect of those capabilities would have been positive. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I I also think more would have been more sooner would have been better. I I do think there's an argument that um, longer range strike capability earlier might have made it more difficult for the Russians to dig in in the you know winter of 22 and into the spring of 23 that might have changed the battlefield dynamic a bit but again you know that's speculative you don't know when the other thing of course is and and this is really coming home to roost for the Ukrainians now the Ukrainians just are not generating enough manpower uh, and that's in part self-imposed because of their reluctance um to move the age of conscription down from 27. I mean, you know, um, this is something I think we've 
mentioned before on the show, which is you talk to folks who've been involved in the training of Ukrainian forces in Europe um, at UCOM, and they're all astonished at how old these guys are, you know, because they're not, um, they're not, you know, they're used to our system where we're basically intaking 18 and 19 year olds, um, as opposed to people in their 30s or 40s. Um, and obviously, there's some, there's an economic uh, side to this, you know, uh, the most productive parts of Ukraine's economy are kind of uh, manned by younger folks. And, you know, you want, um, you don't want to disrupt that or disturb that. Um, there's also just the, you know, it's not politically popular uh, to, you know, to have a, a, you know, kind of universal draft or conscription at, at you know, younger uh, ages in Ukraine. So, um, I mean, that's going to be, I think, a pretty, a pretty serious problem going forward. I, as a historian, um, I, I, we had Jim Shudo on a couple of weeks ago, and we were talking about the 20, you know, uh, late 22 period when, you know, Jim has reported, David Sanger has reported on the concerns the administration had about possible nuclear use. And I think both Elliot and I are somewhat skeptical about, about that. You know, I mentioned, I think, on uh, Jim's show that a very senior uh, former official who was involved um, uh, said to me that he thought part of the problem here was a lot of the, uh, with the exception of the president, who's a different category, but a lot of the other people who were involved in senior decision making had never really thought very hard about the question of nuclear escalation because it was just outside their, you know, professional and historical frame of reference. I mean, as a historian, how do you see that? Do you see some, um, you know, some um, virtue in that argument? Yeah, I mean, I think the the last time anybody in the U.S. government had to think about issues of nuclear escalation and the great power crisis was basically 40 years ago at, at, you know, at the most generous interpretation. And so it's not surprising that as a nation, we are a little bit rusty in having to deal with this stuff. Now, I think the good, the good news is that during the cold war, we accumulated a sufficient amount of interaction with the Soviets, now Russians, that we still think probably accurately that we and the Russians at least speak some of the same language when it comes to nuclear signaling. Right. And and so we sort of know what we would look for if we thought the Russians were very serious about using nuclear weapons. You you would presumably see them move certain forces around, right? Even if they were using tactical nukes that you can't um track that easily. Like I can't imagine that Putin would use nuclear weapons without putting his strategic forces on higher alert first, you know, because he knows what may come a- after that. And and so you know, in the way that we talk about these things and the way that we read the signals, I think there's some degree of confidence built up over the course of the Cold War and sort of inherited from that generation that, you know, we're not speaking totally different languages. But nonetheless, I think your your basic point remains. I'll just, you know, let me add kind of one other thing about the nuclear dimension of this. I think the fascinating thing about um, nukes in Ukraine is that Nuclear coercion is actually working both ways right now. And so the the Russians have effectively coerced the United States and the West in the sense that um, nobody outside of Emmanuel Macron is, you know, talking about insertion of Western forces into the conflict for a variety of reasons. But one of the big ones is the one that Biden said early on, which is that, you know, that could lead to World War Three and and that ain't going to happen over over Ukraine. And it has also been successful in coercing us in limiting the willingness of the Biden administration to provide certain types of military assistance, you know, with with sort of the 300 kilometer ATACMs being the best, most prominent uh, example on that. And so, you know, Putin hasn't won the war through nuclear coercion, but it's helped him avoid losing the war. The, The counterpoint to this is that in a quieter way, because we don't talk about it, the U.S. is using its nuclear arsenal to coerce Russia. And so the, the way I like to illustrate this is think of the counterfactual where you didn't have a NATO that was backed by the U.S. nuclear deterrent. I think the Russians would be far more active in trying to 
coerce, perhaps violently, the countries that are supporting Ukraine, you know, especially Poland, right, which is basically the logistical hub for this entire operation. And they can't do that because, you know, of Article 5, which is ultimately underwritten by the U.S. strategic nuclear deterrent. And so we, we talk about nukes a lot less. We don't advertise it in the same way. But our arsenal, nonetheless, is doing that coercive work for us. It's allowing us to wage, you know, what some have called a proxy war in which Russia is paying a terrible price. Yeah, I, I mean, I could spend the entire time with you talking about the nuclear issues. I, I do want to make one observation before I move you to some other um, issues that I think flow not just from the book, but from your recent foreign affairs article, but which is that it seems to me also there's a very consistent pattern with what we saw observed in the Cold War with Soviet nuclear behavior and Russian uh, behavior in this crisis, which is to say there was a very distinct pattern in, in many Cold War crises of the most lurid and, and um, uh, you know, frightening R Russian threats to use nuclear weapons coming at a point in time where the crisis was already en route to resolution. And, and therefore the nuclear bluff, you know, was ne they knew or had pretty good reason to believe the nuclear bluff was, you know, never going to be called. I mean, it, it's something that we saw in Suez in 1956 in Berlin and um, in the um, in the 1958-61 period and, and in the 1973 uh, uh, Yom Kippur War. So it's very, very consistent uh, pattern. Um, first noticed by the way i would i would point out by francis fukuyama back when he was you know doing um you know uh, a work on on you know what we then called sovietology um and i think you see something similar here which is you know there's if you look at putin in particular his threats which are very vague in general i mean including um, you know, comments to the effect of if the West interferes, they're going to see, you know, a response the likes of which they haven't seen or nobody's seen since 1945. Or There's sort of a lot of allusions to potential nuclear use. But on multiple occasions, including recently uh, in St. Petersburg, when he was put the question directly, are you planning, you know, to use nuclear weapons in Ukraine? He basically says, I, there's no use case. I, there's no way I can use nuclear weapons in in Ukraine. I mean, that frees up, of course, Medvedev and others to uh, and the propagandists on TV to, you know, um, spin these, you know, really, uh, you know, very, uh, you know, scary, um, you know, nuclear scenarios. But, you know, I, you just have the sense that this is a kind of learned reflex from the Cold War, how they're doing it. Yeah, I think I think that's right. And, you know, the reality is that I I worry a lot less about Russian nuclear use now than I did 18 months ago, because the Russians don't need to escalate at, at this point. I mean, frankly, I think Putin believes with some justification that he's winning the war using conventional weapons at this point. And so, the you know, when when we talked about uh, use cases for Russian nuclear escalation. I think the most common scenario was Russian forces have totally lost cohesion, right? And so if it's a rout, Putin's going to lose everything in Ukraine, maybe including Crimea, which um, apart from being strategically and militarily significant is significant because it's central to his narrative of how he has resurrected Russian power and prestige on the international stage. So Putin fears military defeat that's going to lead to political collapse at home and thus uses some limited number of battlefield nuclear weapons as much for the shock value they create as for the battlefield effects that that they create. And we are, um, unfortunately, uh, uh, you know, a long way from a scenario where Russian forces are in headlong retreat right now. You know, one of the... Um themes of the book is, you know, the impact, uh, uh, as you say, on a, the resurrection of a kind of fractured world in, in which um, you have sort of a breakdown of, into kind of two camps, democracy and autocracy, and then a, a, you know, what we might have called in the Cold War era, you know, the third world, and now we tend to call the global south. But basically those countries, as you said, who would like to kind of stay out of the line of fire if they can, 
uh, take advantage if they can of knockdown prices on Russian oil or whatever, um, uh, and you know, trade with all sides and and then play both sides, you know, to maximum benefit for their own, you know, national national interest. But you've written recently about another sort of phenomenon, which is the uh, emergence of uh, tighter um, collaboration, cooperation among these uh, authoritarian regimes, notably including uh, the PRC, um, the DPRK, North Korea, and Iran, all working at various levels with Russia, whether it's supplying Russia with um, you know, artillery shells, as North Korea has millions of artillery shells by train, whether it's uh, you know buying Russian uh, products um, at, at, at you know very um, attractive uh, prices in the case of China, but also providing uh, Russia with financing to uh, you know work around some of the uh, Western sanctions, but also uh, providing Russia with a lot of dual use technologies, um, or whether it's Iran providing uh, you know Shahid drones. Uh, that uh, Russia has used to augment its artillery. Uh, all of this is kind of a different constellation than we saw before the war, uh, and it seems to be tightening. I mean, uh, I characterize this in a conversation with Bill Crystal as as what we've got here is a, a you know a global conflict with regional characteristics. Um, you've made the very interesting point that you think uh, Americans may be somewhat blinded to the impact of these uh, quasi alliances that are emerging in part because they don't really look like, you know, our alliances and our alliance system. Can you talk a little bit about that? But first about the uniqueness of our alliances uh, and then why maybe because of that, we don't really see how disruptive these other arrangements could be. Yeah. So all alliances are uh, a product of their origins, of their circumstances, and U.S. alliances were created for a specific purpose in a specific context. The context was the early Cold War, and the purpose was to deter aggression by a conventionally superior opponent that was located right next to our allies while we were located a long way away. And all and the U.S. and all, basically all of its allies, not quite all, but most of its allies were democracies, right? And so as a result of that, U.S. alliances look a particular way. They feature written, formalized security commitments. Um, they are, you know, feature these ritualized public affirmations of commitment sometime during their first year in office. Every U.S. president, well, almost every U.S. president goes to Brussels or wherever the first NATO heads of state meeting is and and re reiterates you know the article five commitment um they a right feature... of passage for all presidents that's right right um you know they um uh feature extended nuclear deterrence as a central component of, of the alliance and, and so on and so forth and so that's the prism through which americans think about alliances and so when somebody says you know, do country X and country Y have an alliance? We mentally run down the checklist. Well, does it look like the alliances that we have? And if the answer is no, we say, okay, well, that's, that's not an alliance. But what we forget is that um, our alliances are actually historically quite exceptional. Alliances have taken many forms over the years. And if you asked, you know, Bismarck, does the Russia-China relationship count as an alliance? He'd say, absolutely, it counts as an alliance. Because the, the question isn't sort of like, what is the form that the relationship takes? It's what geopolitical functions does it serve and what and what effects does it create? And so when you look at relationships between the and among the Eurasian autocracies, Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, with the exception of China, North Korea, none of them have sort of like a formal mutual defense commitment in the way that we do with our closest allies. But these relationships create these tremendously destabilizing effects. And so if you think about, you know, the Russia, Iran and Russia, North Korea relationships, well, Iran and North Korea have helped Russia hang in there in Ukraine longer than it would have been able to do otherwise by providing it with drones and missiles and artillery shells and other capabilities, while Russia is accelerating their military technological development through some of the advanced capabilities and know-how and tech that it is providing uh, in return. If you think about the Russia-China alliance, 
you get huge geopolitical effects out of the fact that this is basically a de facto non-aggression pact. And so Putin can hurl literally his entire army at Ukraine. You know, there, there's some statistics that indicate 90 percent of the Russian army is in Ukraine at this point because he has no fear whatsoever of aggression from China on their long land border. And you, you can go on and on down the list. But when you start cataloging the actual effects of these things create, you see that they have the they, they have the effect of augmenting both individually and collectively the challenges that these various autocratic states pose to the international system. And by the way, they could do a lot more to destabilize the international system without ever getting close to what we would consider to be an alliance. And so from my perspective, one of the most disturbing aspects of the Ukraine crisis has been the way that it has increasingly convinced the Russians to part with some of their crown technological jewels, things they had held back in these relationships before because they're desperate for, you know, Iranian drones or North Korean artillery or whatever. And so, you know, just from the public reporting, there's, you know, apparently concern that the Russians may be helping the North Koreans with their, you know, missile and uh, advanced weapons uh, capabilities, uh, things of that nature that are going to help the North Koreans hit certain milestones sooner. And if the Russians were to do things like share some of their most advanced um, sub-quieting technology with the Chinese, that would have serious implications for the undersea balance of power in the Western Pacific. And it would have serious implications in one of the few domains where the U.S. still has sort of unquestioned supremacy over the Chinese. And you wouldn't need a formal alliance to get there. Yeah, I mean, you you have in the article, you make uh, some interesting um, analogies, not analogies, you use some examples from the interwar years where these kinds of quasi alliances or or uh, not, well, covert alliances, I think were Apollo, it's fair to say, it was kind of a covert alliance. Um, could you talk a little bit about about those and, and, and why, you know, more broadly, you know, this seems like we're going back to the future. I mean, it does seem like the interwar years, uh, you know, have a lot to say to us today. I mean, in part because we're back in a in a world of great power competition. And, and this time around, instead of being a bipolar competition, it, it's got a lot of different, we've got, you know, two great powers that we're dealing with, but also some lesser powers that are either already nuclear armed or aspire to being nuclear armed, which make it very complicated. So I think there are probably two major takeaways. The the first is that um, the most dysfunctional alliances can still create the most disruptive effects. And so if you go back to the Apollo Pact between uh, then still democratic Germany and the Soviet Union after World War One, basically between two of the big losers of World War One, or you think about the series of um, bilateral pacts that eventually added up to the tripartite pact between uh, Italy, uh, Imperial Japan, and Nazi Germany during World War II, or you think about the Nazi-Soviet pact of, of 1939. I mean, th these were some of the most ill-fated alliances in history. In two out of the three cases, the members ended up fighting and trying to destroy each other. Uh, had the fascist powers somehow won World War II, they undoubtedly would have torn each other apart uh, after the fact, there was not a lot of love uh, in these relationships. And nonetheless, they managed to create these tremendously destabilizing effects, whether in the way that Molotov-Ribbentrop uh, allowed uh, the Soviet Union and Germany to undertake these parallel efforts to reshape big parts of Europe militarily because they were no longer fearful of coming into conflict with each other, even if only te temporarily. Or whether it's in the way that um, Rapallo, or more precisely, that the secret military protocols that Rapallo made possible um, facilitated particularly German rearmament after World War I, and thus gave uh, Hitler that crucial head start in the race to rearm in Europe uh, during the 1930s. You know, as long as these things lasted, they, they created real damage. And so the takeaway for us is don't take much comfort from the fact that you know, Russia and China probably aren't destined to get along forever. You know, the period between now and forever can be pretty long and they can do some damage between now and then. The second takeaway is uh, regional conflicts can add up to 
global crisis or global cataclysm, uh, as it sometimes goes. So, you know, we often think of World War II as a global conflict, but that's mostly because of the, the peculiarities of the American experience. The U.S. joins both the European and the Asian wars late, and it joins them almost simultaneously because of the attack on Pearl Harbor and then Hitler's decision to declare war on the United States a few days later. But that's not how World War II started. World War II started as three separate regional conflicts um, that were caused by Germany's drive for hegemony in Europe, Italy's push for primacy around the Mediterranean Rim and in Africa, and Japan's drive for dominance uh, in East Asia and the Western Pacific that intensified and became more tightly interwoven uh, over time and then merged in catastrophic ways. And that gives us, I think, a new and somewhat sobering way of thinking about the global situation today where you already have wars underway in two of the three key theaters of Eurasia, Eastern Europe and the Middle East. You have rising tensions uh, in the third theater, which is the Western Pacific, and you have the, the conflicts and crises in these regions becoming more tightly interwoven as the ties between the Eurasian autocracies in particular become more pronounced. And so, you know, I, I don't worry so much about a scenario where Xi and Putin and Khamenei or his successor get together and say, like, hey, let's attack the world all at once. I don't think that's what's going to happen. I worry about a scenario in which you have these conflicts that intensify, they escalate, and they become more tightly woven together in a way that gets us into an incredibly disordered global environment as sort of the sum total of these regional conflicts. Yeah, I I completely agree with that, sadly. Um, we're running a little short on time, Hal. Um, and I, I want to, um, I you know, had we had more time, I wanted to get into uh, Ukraine as the... Uh, as you know, the uh, the key to the um, uh, geopolitical uh, heartland. Um, uh, but I know you've got a book coming out on geopolitics uh, towards the end of the year. So I'm going to hold that in abeyance so you can pull even further ahead of Peter Fever and appearances on Shield of the Republic. But I, I do want to touch on one final issue before we let you go. And that is, there's another way in which the current moment seems to... Um, uh, very much uh, be redolent of the 1930s, and that's uh, the recrudescence of of isolationism, particularly in the Republican Party. Um, it, you know, it's a phenomenon that Bob Kagan has written about recently in a very lengthy uh, piece in the Washington Post. I wrote about it uh, from a slightly different angle in in Sapir. Um, you've written several things about well, how this is more and more like the 30s and you know, my take on this is that this was, um, uh, there was a tradition in the Republican Party of of this. It was largely located in the Midwest and by and large among progressive Republicans, um, but not only, included conservatives, certainly like Robert Taft, who became perhaps the most well-known spokesperson for this uh, point of view or persuasion inside the Republican Party. Uh, that kind of view was sort of suppressed in some sense in 1952 by um, Eisenhower. And it, it continued to have an existence, you know, in the form of John Bricker uh, and uh, Pat Buchanan and, and others who continued to hold that view, but it was very much a minority view in the Republican Party. Uh, Donald Trump, uh, who very much, I think, you know, sort of, harkens back to this. It's, I think his views, you know, eerily similar to, uh, you know, ones uh, that Taft articulated. And that's something that uh, Tom Wright, you know, formerly of Brookings, now inside the Biden administration and George Will have all, you know, taken notice of. Um, and I guess my question to you is, uh, do you think this is a kind of lasting shift in the Republican Party? Is this an epiphenomenon connected to Trump? Is there a way back? How do you see this playing out? So there are obviously deeper roots within the Republican Party, but I, I guess I would say I, I think it's it's illustrative that none of the Trump wannabes in the Republican Party have managed to 
capture the enthusiasm and the energy of the base in the way that Trump has, which, which indicates to me that a lot of what's happening with Trump is more about personal connection. It's about a psychological connection. It's about emotion than it is about policy per se. And it also indicates to me that, you know, if and when Trump passes from the scene and the first thing that needs to happen is he needs to lose in November. But if and when he passes from the scene, there's going to be a fight for the soul of the Republican Party on this. And, uh, you know, you, currently at this point, it would be hard to bet against the neo-isolationist uh, types. But, you know, the person who came in second in the Republican primary was Nikki Haley, who, who would have been quite at home in the George W. Bush administration under Ronald Reagan, who was sort of a more traditional Republican internationalism. And so I think it's, it's, it's better to say that the fight will be on rather than the fight will be over once uh, Trump uh, and his time on the national stage has come to an end. Well, Hal, it's been great to have you on. Our guest has been Hal Brands, um, historian, prolific author, um, columnist, essayist, uh, and uh, for the moment, uh, editor of a new volume, uh, War in Ukraine, Conflict Strategy, and the Return of a Fractured World. Hal, thanks for being with us on Shield of the Republic and look forward to having you back. Thanks so much for having me, Eric.